Some small errors are good for the students. <laughs> Spend time there, and by that time they will understand what is before that. Because they will not get it. They will go through once again and... Then. So making errors... Uh, the teachers is always good. That's one way to learn. All right. So in this last one, about optimal control, tomorrow I'll do something different. I'll do the dynamic programming principle. Some ideas about it. Used DDT. Okay. And then uh, how it leads to Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. So that this is the Pontre agent what we have discussed in the last period was about the Pontre agent in the 1950s and then uh, as I said the kind of intense activity started by that time uh, your uh, Soblo spaces are all in the Sobler spaces were introduced was in the 1930s in the morning, but then distribution was there, everything was in a, a good calculus on that, everything was available. And then with non-smooth calculus, so, so it, that's how it started that. But it's more or less at the same time the Bellman started, probably at the same time. And his idea, so if you look at your infimum, and uh, of this function, right, in infimum of whatever it is, L, T naught to T1, you do it. So this is called the minimal value. So he was no looking at the minimal value. So the minimal value, let me have a new notation, V. This minimal value, we never said what the minimum, we are bothered about the optimal control, optimal value, uh, state. So you substitute, you get the minimal value. And this is a J of U, so I will, uh, but let me, uh, denote by view. But this also depends, of course, your, your initial point T naught and uh, initial x naught, right? Where your trajectory is at T naught from the point x1. So it's a point in that one. Eh? Uh, it will not depend on you. Yeah, when you think it will. Yeah, that's true. I just wrote J. Uh, that's fine. That's right. So the cost functional depends on uh, not only the cost, not only the control, it also depends on the individual control. The, as I said yesterday in the introduction, the idea was to vary x t naught and x naught. Vary t naught and x naught. That means initially you are starting with a point at x at t naught is equal to x naught and looking for trajectories and things. So you vary this one here also at both t1 and x1. So that Feeling behind varying this uh, x naught and t1, so you vary t naught in the neighborhood of t naught, t1, and then also vary all that. And look at the trajectory, so you look at the system, so you need a parameter, different parameter. So instead of looking at just x at t naught is equal to x naught, you look for the trajectories starting at any point x at t, t now uh, fix t and x, you fix t and x, for the trajectory and look for the minimal thing. That's what you are doing it, going to do that. The idea why he is that, that and, uh, the one of the uh, one point by varying, you can find out the intrinsic properties of the minimal values. It's, I told you yesterday, if you want to understand the function and its properties of the intrinsic properties of that function, knowing the value of that function at one point is not enough. You have to know the value of the function in the neighborhood of that point. So the whole idea is that you look at this dynamics, 
x of t is equal to f of i. S I am introducing new because I used already t x and uh, x of s and u of s. So, one is to understand the intrinsic property of V, intrinsic property. And second thing, as far as practically it is concerned, it is quite natural because uh, practically you cannot have any problem exactly starting at the time t naught, I think. You are going to make errors, disturbances, and things. You will never get exact values in practical problems. So, understanding this value function from this one and looking at not just at t naught, in the neighborhood of t naught at x naught is also important. So, what you do is that you look, and whenever you are writing here, you look at t and x and look at this infima. Now, do you get that uh, the difference which you are going to do that one? So, you are minimizing overall trajectories starting at point x at t. So, you are minimizing overall trajectories from here also. So, you have all the trajectories according to the control and then you get the minimum whatever is the optimal path, you get that one. That is uh, two issues which were there, but there are more to it. These are not just that, there is something more. It is uh, principle of cost to go, that is what we are going to. I will also show you one example where in the computation wise it is much more a simple final dimensional example, okay. And uh, what do I want to tell that one? What is the next point? I do not want to miss uh, some of the important point, which you will see soon. Another important C, the, uh, that you, you do not see it now, but I want to see that what is the kind of uh, uh, points. I want to pinpoint you what dynamic programming principle offers you. Eventually, that is what I want to say. When just you read the formulas and theorems, you may not get it. Another interesting point, suppose you have an optimal trajectory. That is a feature. That is the thing you have to prove it. When you have an optimal control problem or a differential game theory problem and the feature what I am telling is what you have to prove, it has a functional relation. Suppose you have an optimal trajectory, uh, trajectory. Starting at the point x naught is nothing but x at t naught. And along the trajectory you take here at any time tau. So it will be the time t naught plus tau. And you suppose this x at t naught plus tau is something, some point it may be x tau. So with t naught plus tau, you consider the same optimal control problem with this as your initial point. So, you have a new optimal control problem with a different uh, initial point and initial state. What uh, eventually the DPP tells you which will write it as a theorem, functional the uh, relation which is a theorem, that optimal trajectory will be this one only. So, starting with this, this as an initial point, you can have many trajectories. You see, what it says that the remaining part of an optimal trajectory. So, if you take a log optimal trajectory and take a point on the point and look at the optimal control problem with that as your initial state, the remaining part of will remain as your optimal trajectory. So, you can have a proof of that. If you can provide a theorem for your problems, you will be getting your uh, many correct results based on that. And differential game theory and other things proving such results are much more complicated. Because in differential chain theory, there will be a minimax coming. It may not be always max or always min. There will be u1, u2, u and many controls will, at least to even two uh, player games, you will be having the cost function with u1 and u2. Okay. And then you have to, one guy will try to minimize, other guy will try to maximize. Right? Suppose uh, two players, uh, players are playing together. And one is always a winner and other play, uh, player is always a loser. Then what is you are trying to do? You always try to lose as less as possible, right? A weak football team with a strong team, right? You know that you lose, but uh, try to lose it as uh, little as possible, okay? So that will lead to problems like minimax, okay? Or you can say that the net effect is zero, but in other words, if you have a, a both of you are doing something, if I lose, it will be for other person. 
So, I want to lose as minimum as possible. So, I try to minimize it. Other person will try to, so you have to have the strategies, you want and you to. So, and there also you have to prove this kind of DPP, it's a dynamic programming principle relations, which you want to do that. So, let me try to see in, in a computation very nice thing. You may, you can elaborate on that one. Suppose you want to move from x x naught to x1 to x2, something like that. At n, x n, you want to go it. But to move from one point, so you have, suppose you have a move from one point, you want to move it. But then you can move that with a different cost. Suppose you can move with a, a different trajectories. So I reference a different trajectory, something like that. There is a picture given. So you will have a cost to go. So going to the first step. From here also to go. In other words, I want to go from xk to xk plus 1. When I want to go to xk to xk plus 1, I will have uh, choices of, say, m controls. I will have different. So, I will have basically from any point, I have m choices. Okay. And then, uh, I want to go like that. So, each trajectory will have a cost uh, associated with the, at each stage. And which comes from a set of controls whose cardinality is basically M. The control cardinality of the control possibility, the cost is M. So how do you call the, so which is the trajectory I will reach from the point here to the point, final point. I want to reach there. But there will be little more complicated. You can also have the different states. You have a different set. The number of possible states are also have some finite cardinality. Then if you count the trajectories, which I have counted in the notes, but you can do it, you can see that you have the number of trajectories will be order of m power n, n, and maybe some l also will come, the number of states. So that many trajectories will be there to count it. You can count it starting with 3 or 4 or 2. Okay? And that's a normal way of counting it, the computation. But the principle of cost to go is the more interesting thing instead of counting forward, so there will be a reaching here, each step it will have a cost, and that cost will have different choices. And at the end of it, when you reach, there will be a final cost, which I said that, there will be a final cost. Okay. The thing is that you can apply a backward iteration. When you have a backward iteration, what you do is that at each stage, this is your nth stage, suppose, each one will have a cost, when you reach here, you have a terminal cost. Okay. So the idea of this whole backward uh, uh, retraction, backward iteration is that from here, I am not coming from here. At each stage, I will look what is my best cost. I will try to associate at the n minus 1 level a terminal cost. What is my terminal cost? The cost to go from here to here plus its uh, terminal cost. Okay. This terminal cost together with the cost to go and for each one of them I associate already I find the optimal cost to go from here to here. That I call it as its uh, terminal cost at this level. But then when I want to come from n minus 2 to here, I already computed my optimal cost at that level. So I don't have to look now in the earlier case when I come here, after that I have to do all kinds of computation with that one. You can do a counting and then when you do that one, you don't have to, you already have a terminal cost. That means, in other words, from here it's a terminal cost, the cost to go from here to here or in the kth stage, at the kth stage I already calculated my optimal cost and then I can get something instead of that, you will be getting a curve easily. In other words, the computational cost involved will be in the order of MNL. You can uh, just elaborate and uh, you can do that one. So, that's a kind of optimality. These are the kind of things motivated in that way. So, if you have a, a, at a certain stage, if you realize that you already know the optimal cost uh, from that position, then you vary here what are the possibilities. Add it and do a minimization that. And this leads to the, what is called the dynamic programming principle.
which you have to prove it, which I don't do it here. So let me introduce properly. So you have your Vtx is equal to minimum of Jtx u. Minimizing over u, but this is the trajectory where x equal to xt is the trajectory here. Okay. And what is your my j x t x u j t of x u is equal to integral t naught to t l of t x t. No, let me use yes. This is a t two t one final point l of s x of s q of s d s plus a terminal cost k of x at t one. This is my terminal cost. This is my running cost. And what is x of s, u of s? x of s, u of s starts this one. So it's a solution trajectory starting from the point x at time t, going to the time t1, reaching the point x. That you have a x at t. This is the point x, a trajectory u. That's called the and this is called the v is called the value function. Now you view it as a value function. Where does the value function take? So v is a mapping from t naught to infinity. You can take any t you like it here. Cross r i. So the value function v is a mapping from t naught to infinity cross r n to r. And it also have a bound condition v t 1 x will be your k of x. We can get that. So, clear about the whole setup? Forget about whatever I said if you do not remember. But at least uh, this is all right. Is it all right? The setup is all right about the value function. The introduction of the value function is, is the same minimal value. The only thing is that now I am trying to view instead of t naught and x naught are fixed, I am varying t naught and x naught. And hence you have a function. And so for each tx, you have the minimization. You see? You have that. So here is the theorem of DPP. So, let me just state what I said theorem, dynamic programming principle. Uh, what is that? For every Tx belongs to T0 to T1 cross Rn and for all tau great belongs to T to T1. So, I am only starting my trajectory and this is, this is part of this. For all tau in that one, but I say that you look at, so the, what am I trying? I am trying to look for a trajectory t starting at the point x and along that point I am taking a time here, so I have my x tau here. So, that is why this is at x t is equal to x, at time t equal to it's a you have evolved a trajectory. Okay, that's it. And then looking at this point tau x tau. So when I write my v of tau x tau, what does this mean? You get that point? This is the minimum value for the trajectory initiates at time tau at the point x tau. That is what you have to understand. So, this is my point at tau x tau. So, I am looking for the minimum cost required to go from this initial thing. And what is my v of t x? v of t x is the minimum cost required to go from the point x at time t to t 1. Everything is to t 1. So, this is the minimum cost. Not, uh, so, this may be the trajectory here. 
But this is the cost, minimum cost to go from here to here. And at the to x to I look for the minimum cost. And then I have my integral cost, the running cost to, to reach from my t to top. And that is nothing but L of s, x of s, u of s. You see that? What is this one? This is my cost, running cost required to go from the state x at time t to the time at t. And then at t x t, this is the minimum cost required. And I vary you. The moment I vary you, I will have a different one. I will have a different one. For all each of them, I am calculating. So I am each of the t here. I am calculating the minimum t required. Okay. And if I minimize this one over now over all u, and I get back my minimal cost. You got the formula? This is the formula you always uh, require to prove. You eventually get something and to get it. And this, uh, this is uh, basically a uh, functional equation, right? It's not a differential equation so far. And PDE people would like to get its uh, differential equation, right? Not just functional equation. I spent leaving you two minutes so that you can con uh, conceive the uh, idea behind that one. All right. So just. Go. An infinite. So you, if in a smooth analysis, a smooth situation, assuming V is smooth or C two, etc and do your Taylor expansion and using that theorem. And if you do an infinitesimal analysis, an infinitesimal version is what will lead to the Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation. So in the smooth situations, proving that will not be, it's a very classical analysis. You can do some infinitesimal analysis to get your Hamilton-Jacobi equation which is a first order PDE, TX. So let me not try. So different books may write slightly different form. Sometimes you see soup, sometimes you see mean, info. But don't get confused, that depends on which side it is putting. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. L of TXU minus DX at TX. So that's something like a Hamiltonian will come, you know, try that. And it also has a condition at Vt1x. This is what the Hamilton-Jacobi equation is. So we will, if you have this type of formula, you will be able to derive such formula, at least formally, assuming that LF everything is smooth. You will be able to do that. Is that okay? That's right. So some books will write this in this side, it's right equal to zero in that case we plus and info. I don't care. The formula is basically that. The same thing. All right. So the two point, a few points which uh, I was repeatedly telling, now you may be able to understand it in a better way. The value functions, as you said, normally, as you see, uh, is not smooth. You do not get the smoothness on this data. And you don't have smoothness. Uh, how do you interpret this equation? How do you view it as a solution of this equation? And this is what is eventually 1980s or something. Maybe just a little before, and the uh, concept of viscosity solutions. Um, I'm sure Shaiju will do at least the definition of what you mean. How do you interpret 
the a continuous function and more generally later as a uh, even discontinuous function as solutions to this first order equation one of the methods which you are all seeing is the distribution theory approach and the, yesterday i told you that distribution theory is fine to handle generally linear equations and non linear equations are also possible if there is a structure like conservation law you can do it but all the time you cannot interpret uh, the solutions of uh, non linear differential equations via distribution theory approach okay so basically as i, as I mentioned this is a in general is a linear theory the distributions uh, so it, this is a very highly non linear differential equation sir and distribution theory is not at all suitable to see just one example i just want to, i will come to back to this again to see just one example which are familiar you there are plenty of small examples you can give it so you look at uh, the solution uh, the differential equation mode in one dimension you just look at it okay and and with u at minus 1 is equal to u at 1 is equal to 0 so you have one minus 1 here and one here one uh, good exercise which all of you should do it today before coming tomorrow that uh, prove that this has no smooth solution you cannot have a smooth solution to that equation okay no smooth solution so this is a bit of a non linear equation to see and uh, but then you can relax you can introduce other type of concepts here you can't do easily right any type of integration by parts but he said in the morning is that one of the fundamental thing all this analysis is integration by parts you are not able to do that you don't way have easy way of doing that integration by parts here doesn't allow you to do that so the whole proofs and most of the things depends on the integration by parts that's why pd people generally tell if you don't know what to do do an integration by parts later justify just like fourier analysis just take fourier transform right to do an integration by but that prevents here all these equations so there are some sort of weaker concepts one uh, some of the weaker concepts are lipschitz solution okay fine i don't demand that it is a solution everywhere uh, it's a solution okay even if it's a, not a solution at some finitely many point i will accept it if you relax that little bit that i don't want a c to c1 solution but i don't mind i if you have the discontinuities or continuity if you have lose your differentiability at finite number of points the moment you relax little bit i have a solution uh, i have a solution like this you see right that's clear right what do you want you want the derivative to be 1 so it's a minus 1 1 so you have 1 oh so this one and this is minus one fine whatever it is mode is one but then i can construct many solution i go up to half of it i come back that's also a solution because it's a solution except at this point so you have continuous solutions except at finally many so for solution so in other words in measure theory way it's an almost everywhere solution if you allow you have infinitely many solution i can repeat this and this direction also you can do so when you relax you have to have few things you have to see when you are general give a solution in repetition you have to see that whether it's physically meaningful that solution and then uh, that's why this almost every other solutions is not a very good concept to capture that so it's not that there are no other concepts and the weak formulation is a real motivation it has its own way in fact many solutions minimization problems leads to weak solutions and then you will uh, demand more that's where you get your pd right if you look at the gradient of u square minimization problem it first what you get is the weak formulation not the strong form strong form you will be available only if it is smooth but weak form you can directly derive from your euler equation if you apply the minimization principle you get it and your practical problem is a minimization problem you see there you don't demand anything uh, like uh, smoothness but you get it 
So quite often the weak formulation has the direct consequence of your problem, actual physical problem. Uh, it's not the strong form. But PDA, like uh, what we try to do is I will try to attack because it's nice, PDA. So you don't get it, you have to give the correct interpretation. So the viscosity solutions introduced has some nice features which you will see. One of the fundamental features, there is a very good max, uh, motivation via maximum principle which you may see. Uh, in which way he introduces, I don't know. But one of the crucial thing of concept of viscosity solution is the stability. And in practical problems, you have to have your stability because you are not going to measure anything exactly. A small perturbation itself, you should have the solution. If you have the correct small perturbations in their terms, uh, in the nonlinear term, uh, and if you look for a viscosity solution, and that should converge actually to the original solution under suitable assumptions. So the viscosity solutions uh, have that stability property nicely for this nonlinear problem where you interpret your solution as solution to this one. Though it is started for the Hamilton Jacobi equation, what it is, it's flourished like an independent field. So and more in uh, peop uh, papers like uh, Leon's and Crandall, there are plenty of, not just Leon's and Crandall <coughs> and many other people like Ishii and plenty ones, many, many people have a, uh, there's a large amount of literature in the viscosity solution where they study more general equations of nonlinear equation, not necessarily of that form. So for the nonlinear equations, you can interpret uh, your homogeneous thing. Okay. And uh, the another important point about DPP viewpoint is also a sufficient condition which I am telling you. So there is also a theorem which I will just state here. Theorem. There is a what is called a verification theorem. So it also works as a verification theorem. So when you are trying to prove study optimal control problems and different things, these are the issues you have to treat and prove a similar or analogous results. Okay, you have to prove that one. Let x bar u bar be an optimal solution to the ODE. We have an ODE uh, dynamics already. So we always uh, solution. And phi belongs to C1 satisfies HJB, HJB, satisfies HJB and that's not just enough and it should satisfy, you have to have some Hamiltonian behind it, it has to come, it has to satisfy at a maximum principle, okay, because uh, that you expect, right, the maximum principle is this one in this case, phi x at t, correct, I have to write, I want to write it correctly, x bar of t evaluated that optimal solution, so phi x at f of t, this is your, uh, this corresponds to your, uh, eventually corresponds to your Hamiltonian, maybe if I have time I will state it, this one plus L of t, this means that you are evaluating at the optimal solution. If you evaluate at that maximum solution, this will be the, I will continue here, that should be the maximizing thing. That means your U bar maximizes this kind of Hamiltonian type thing. Okay? Is equal to minimum, I am right, the minimum coming because it is on the right side of phi x at t x bar dot f of t x bar of t u, see you are minimizing over u, l of t x bar of t u. So if you have such a function which is a solution to this one, which satisfies this minimization or maximization principle, then 
sorry, uh, there is something wrong I wrote it. I mean, I'm trying to write an uh, uh, <laughs> sufficient condition, right? Be a solution. I want to see when, so what I derived so far is a necessary condition, starting with an optimal solution. Now I'm starting with any solution, and then there, suppose there is a P which satisfies your Hamilton Jacobi equation together with my sentence, then x bar u bar is an optimal solution. So the dynamic programming principle also gives you a verification or a uh, sufficient condition. That is something different was not available in your Pontryagin's principle. The Pontryagin's principle just provided an optimal solution. But here you have a verification theorem. No, no, x bar will be there. You fix x bar. If you look at the Hamiltonian things, uh, u will be changing. X bar will be the trajectory associated with u bar. Okay? But then, exactly we have wrote then the u bar, the control, should be obtained. That's what you say. You are replacing the control here. It has to have that. Even if you look at the previous theorem, the x bar is there. Okay. So you are maximizing. So the at the u bar t. So you think it as it's a, again fixing t and minimizing. You think that it is fixing t. Then x bar t is mini, uh, fixed and then minimize this function. Okay. And then you will get an x bar u bar as a solution. Okay. I want to tell you a few more things. Yeah. Yeah. Few, uh, so there are two more, uh, few more things I want to tell. So the, even the Hamilton Jacobi equation, these kind of things were available. But at that time, it's actually uh, used as a necessary condition as we have derived. The first to see that this Hamilton Jacobi equations uh, also can be used for the sufficiency is due to Carathiotry at the Hamilton Jacobi level in the 1800s, 30s, and 40s. But for the Hamilton Jacobi Billman equations, again it's derived as that one, and then the that's immediate. Then after the uh, using the ideas of Carathiotry, Kalman viewed it as a sufficient condition again. Okay. Yeah, Kalman is the first one given even for the finite dimensional system necessary and sufficient conditions for controllability. At the time tomorrow, I will try to tell you. That's one point. Second point, which I want to tell you here. Um, okay, what is that? Yeah, I, uh, before that, uh, I will come to that. That's one more very, very crucial point about the Hamilton Jacobi equation. And I'll come to that. Now I want to have this one more connection which I want to tell again is uh, some of the very, very important and crucial points. So I want to see the, some connection between PMP and DPP. How does the DPP tells you? This is very crucial, very, very important. How does the PMP, the Hamiltonian done? You have this x dot is equal to HP and P dot is equal to minus hx. This is the fundamental canonical system of equations. And what we have done? We have done the uh, maximize this Hamiltonian h of x star of t u p star of t. And what we have done by maximization of the Hamiltonian, you get your u star of t. If you do this maximization, you get your h of x star, u star at t, everything at t, u star at t, this is uh, uh, p star, p star at t. Okay. So this is what it is done in the, so this is written symbolically as u star maximizes this Hamiltonian and is called the basically symbolically rate it as, it's used in arg max of h of x star t u p star t. So that's, that's one done in the 
So, if you want to have a control uniformly, it depends both on x star and p star. Everything is defined implicitly, but if you have a to write down your control, it tells you that the x star is constructed based on x uh, u star is have the relation based on x star and p. So, this is what is called a complete information not only about the state, you should also have your information about your cost state. And this is what is called an open loop strategy, completely open loop control. But if you try to write the Hamilton DPP and Hamilton Jacobi equation, I can write down all that, which uh, I can put the appropriate Hamiltonian there also. I can introduce the Hamiltonian here also, STXUP is, uh, what is the Hamiltonian here? P F minus L and uh, what you will get here, you can write down this, it's there in the notes anyway. Just let me write down this one, U star of E, arg max, a similar thing, you can write down the corresponding equation and you have this one, H of X star of T u minus v x of x star of t, you see, see also here. What does this tells you that? So, if you, that is also related to your sufficiency property basically. You have a, so suppose you have a solution to your Hamilton Jacobi equation v and if you evaluate that v at that control, you can write, you can get your control why are the solutions to the Hamilton Jacobi equation solution if you know x star well? And what this implies that you can design your control as a function of basically the state. In other words, your control has a representation in terms of the state alone if you have your solution to your Hamilton Jacobi equation. This is what is called the feedback procedure, okay, or uh, it is also called optimal feedback specification. And that is what you want it, right, engineers are basically looking for uh, feedback specification and the Hamilton, solution to the Hamilton Jacobi equation, so optimal control gives you uh, somehow the representation of your control. So, it looks like it is as extremely novel. This Hamilton Jacobi equations is uh, and the DPP is extremely novel compared to Pontryagin principle. But unfortunately, it depends on the solution to your Hamilton Jacobi equations, and Hamilton Jacobi equation does not have smooth solutions, you see. So, on, for mathematicians and other people, it is fine, it is more uh, nice uh, thing, but uh, two things are there. For the engineers, engineers uh, are not as much uh, interested in your just your theoretical result unless you provide them with a recipe and unless you provide them that easy way of computation, they will not be happy. So, for them, they are more happy with their uh, Pondragian principle because it gives you a place to look for your control. It may not give you and also you need to solve only ODEs. There is no PDE involved there, but DPP to achieve that. Uh, Yes, if you achieve, you achieve a lot, but then you will not quite often, you will not be able to do that one. So, what we want to say is that uh, uh, both, uh, it has the advantages, it is what we call it a pros and cons, right. Both theories, both the GPP and the PMP uh, have its uh, pros and cons. Uh, all of you are tired? Eh? If you are not tired, I will end with the last page of my notes. Somehow it could reach there. Otherwise, I can also stop it. You can ask them. <laughs> so do you want more or not? They are tired. <laughs> So, there is only one page, last, eh, good.
<laughs> very good. Two minutes, I don't do much. I will end with an example. Okay. As I say, don't erase that board. I, I want to use that board. What have you written? Is there? Okay, fine. That's good. And that... I want to send some stories about it. Uh, good, good. No, no, don't erase it. No, no, I will write what I erased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he will tell more story because he works more. <laughs> On that, you okay. can. Solutions, the concept doesn't uh, appear in the literature to encode the maximum principles of uh, parabolic equations. So, since the definition of uh, this the solution is uh, concerned with the minimum of, uh, of a function and the sign. Yeah, that is true, that's true. That's a maximum principle of uh, PDE, is there? Yeah. yeah. It's a definition is given in that form. Yeah. No, definition doesn't involve, but definition of viscosity solution yeah. motivates from the maximum, not this type of maximum principle. There are maximum principles of PDE, right? From the, the motivation comes, for me it comes two ways, there may be many ways. One, the definition is motivated from the maximum principles of PG. The plus and u equal to f. There are maximum principles, right? Related to that. So it is uh, very nice. Maybe he will present tomorrow. Another way of defining that one that gives you a very good motivation. How to interpret uh, when you have only continuity, how do you interpret that one, the definition? What do you do that if you have supp supp uh, the one way to see is that? Uh, suppose you have something. I'm not writing down definition. But then you see you can have smooth curves. Nice smooth curves. There. See two curves like that. So you can really motivate one way. The second thing is that about the sub difference, this also picture motivates you. You can also, if your function is not a differentiable, you can define what is called a sub differential and you can also see the super differential. And then you can have that. And then you can connect this sub differential uh, can be written as some sort of the tangent to your smooth functions. Okay? And then you can interpret that inequality definitions of subsolution and super solution. Okay. And the viscosity terminology probably came from the conservation law. You want to study this equation. This equation can be studied in the distributional sense. But then it's a first order equation, you don't get, a, a, you know these equations generate discontinuities, right? For example, you know these equations very well. Okay, and it uh, develops uh, singularities, the solution. But then if I add a second order term here, then it is regular. It's a second order regular, you have a smooth solution. And this is something like if you have the, this is exactly like a, if you write down the equations for Laplacian coefficient, the viscosity in that thing, right? So it's a vanishing viscosity method. So this kind of solutions, if you take limit to this one and interpret it, uh, you will get a solution which is defined only in the sense of viscosity and that matches with that. I don't know, this probably came much earlier, right? That's why I, I want to tell you the story. Okay, so, so, I don't want to... ah, so he will tell more story about that one. Okay. So quickly two minutes. This is just an example of the what is called a linear quadratic pro, uh, regulator. Linear. How you can again simplify uh, uh, quite a few things. And this is a star uh, example of all engineers. They immediately control theory they study. They study probably this is the first problem they look into that. So your state dynamics is linear. That's what it is called a linear problem. It is ATX plus BTU. You can work out, you see, it's not, this is your F. No. You can write down everything in a more simpler form. You see, immediately you see. And your cost is quadratic. So you write down T0 to T1 
um, x transpose q this overall matrix everything depends on t x plus u transpose r u there is one more term a terminal cost x transpose at t1 m x at t1 okay. you need all this uh, some symmetry and all that all that to reduce something like that all are uh, symmetric but then q and m are semi definite and r it to be a regular problem and you want the minimization problem everything to be nice uh, you need this okay so you have a regularity so you can write down everything this is valid everything is valid here and uh, you can write down all that in a much simpler form that's what i want to say so if you write your htx i will quickly do instead of deriving but you go and do it it's a nice problem to derive so apply this method and uh, complete the proofs in between what i'm giving you you have this p transpose ax plus p transpose au evident no sorry b transpose bu minus x transpose q x plus u minus u transpose r e. you can derive your hp that one and you can you can write your control in this form it's not determined but you can get this formula r inverse of t b transpose of t p star of t so you can represent your control uh, in terms of your cost it this uh, pdes you will see quite often this writing your uh, control in terms of the adjoint state okay and you can also do little more this is one step you can write down the second step you can write this is a very crucial thing an interesting thing minus 2 pt into x star this is of course a unknown matrix right now but it brings you some information it brings you that your cost state and uh, x uh, state has a linear relation that's a very important information because it's a matrix which is an unknown matrix right now but your cost state can be represented in terms of the state okay with that you can do little more you can rewrite your control thing just two lines i will stop it you can write your u star of p in minus r inverse b transpose p and x you see what does this gives you this gives you an immediate feedback law where engineers are looking for all the time the moment you know p feedback law that's a, and the feedback law is a linear relation that's also there it's a very nice linear relation and the final thing p satisfies riccati equation that you know how to it's an algebraic equation that's not pd any longer p satisfies riccati equation that definition is what riccati equation is given in notes which is basically an algebraic equation so no pd at all here so in the linear quadratic regulator problem everything is eventually reduces to the solution of the riccati equation and i'm sure in three more lectures you will see plenty of riccati equations at various time in the next week when you study the different control problem they eventually try to give proper feedback law so that uh, it reduces to your riccati equation and that you are going to see so i will stop so tomorrow we will do some quick controllability yeah it is too tiring it is too tiring that